My husband used to say that uh, when we went out to places, when I first started doing what we call the work, he'd say, don't tell people what you do. And I'd go, okay. So I started saying, not to people I, that knew me, but strangers, you know. I'd say, oh, well, you know, I work in healthcare. And I finally started to say I was a dietitian. But I went out to a, an anniversary party, a birthday party actually, 50th birthday party, and there was a mixture of friends. She was one of my nurses, and there was a mixture of all different people. And this man came up to me and he said, oh, I heard about what you do. And I go, so what do I do? He said, oh, I was talking to your husband. You do this forensic stuff and you know an FBI agent. And I go, yes. And oh, what else did my husband tell you? So he elaborated. and. My husband had it pretty right about what I did. So we were going home, I said, I guess it's okay, I don't have to say that I'm a dietitian anymore. And he just laughed. Because he, you know, at first he was embarrassed a bit about why, what kind of work I did, and because it was so unusual. And then he became proud of me and my work. Because these patients, are unique in that their needs intersect with the law and with the justice system, that they all have health needs, whether they're physical or psychological. And the forensic nurse who's trained in all those areas is able to not only provide best practice patient care, but also to assist the legal system and the, and the uh, law enforcement to accomplish their roles as well. What do we want the patient to feel like when he or she comes into the emergency room having had this experience? What do we want the patient to feel like when he or she leaves the emergency department? I was called into the hospital last night by triage at Surrey Memorial Hospital. They told me that there was a young patient that was requesting to see me. So when I walked into the room, she was sitting on the couch, curled up in a little ball, and she was leaning on on the armrest of the couch and she was like this looking down. When I spoke to her I wanted her to know that I would do what I could to make her feel safe in that room. I asked her is there anything that you need to talk to me about right now medically? Are you medically okay? And at that point she said I don't think I am. That's what forensic nursing is, is to listen to both the verbal and the unspoken about their violence, about their trauma, and about the crime that may have been committed. As a forensic nurse, the medical side of that always has to be looked at first. She was bleeding quite heavily, and she had told me that she had found some small marbles inside of her vaginal area, and she didn't feel right. She was cramping and sore. She signed the consent and we started the examination. She had not showered, so we flared her body in the dark, looking for blood, semen, anything that would fluoresce in the darkness. We um, documented physical injuries on her body. She had quite a bit of bruising up her arm, down her back. She sat up in the bed and was looking at what I was drawing and asking questions about it and became a little bit more involved because it was her. It was her body and she wanted it to be documented perfect. If people are treated in a way that is with dignity, with respect, with looking at their choices, uh, they will not go on to suffer the psychological and emotional trauma that we know happens after crimes, violence and trauma. We document every injury that we see and then I proceed to do a vaginal examination at the end. We collect swabs. I also did something called a motility slide and that's a little bit of the vaginal pool washings on a slide and we look underneath the microscope. She was wanting me to see if there was any semen on the slide. We then process that, all our evidence, we cut the ends of our swabs, we put them back in the swab container, we label them with the patient's name, put them in the envelope, label the envelope. I don't normally see that much injury and I think just seeing that and her crying on the bed when I was doing the examination and just her emotional distraughtness and the injury. Whatever happens to her after, she'll remember 
you and your caring. Yeah. She might not remember all the good things, she won't remember all the bad things, but what she will remember is there was a nurse mm -hmm. who changed my life that night because of the way she treated me. Mm -hmm. When I was walking down the hall, she grabbed my hand and her chin was up. And she walked down that hall and she said, Amy, you gave me control of my body back. I lost control of my body. I don't remember what happened to my body. You gave me that control back and I thank you for being here tonight for me. And she hugged me. Hey Heather, it's Bobby Joe with the coroner's office. I think what we're going to do is go ahead and move him over to MUSC and we will do the autopsy over there as a forensic case due to his fall. In my office in Charleston, South Carolina, I will get a call, I or one of my deputies, and somebody's on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And whenever that call comes in, we're going to respond to the scene of the death. We're going to do in conjunction with, but independently of, law enforcement's crime scene investigators. We're gonna do our own examination, our own photographs, evidence collection, etc. The coroner is the person who, in essence, owns the body. And the body often is a very huge piece of the investigation and the primary piece of evidence. You might think that when you do a case that you receive a person, you do the autopsy and, and sh should do that in a black box without actually having any knowledge of the circumstances surrounding the death. But in fact, we need a lot of information. We rely heavily, almost solely, on the coroners to be able to provide us with information um, surrounding the death. A number of them are the forensic nurses. They have had uh, training in that and certification in that. With that experience, they bring to them a lot of the medical knowledge that's involved in death investigation. We're educated in everything from growth and development to pharmaceutical issues. We're involved with grief and wound healing and anatomy and physiology and injury and on and on and on. And we're already steeped in dealing with families and people in times of stress. They are the investigators. They are the ones that are finding out you know, who last saw the person, what were the circumstances that existed when they last saw the person, what was their medical history, and how that could all be related and be pertinent to the autopsy. Because we're nurses, we don't just treat that evidence as a swab or a shell casing, but rather as an individual. And of course, part of that is that that individual has family. When I come into a scene, I'll go and introduce myself to the officer and then I'll ask where's the family and then I go directly to the family and that comes from my nursing background that that I approach that family first and oftentimes I'm the first person who's gone in and said I'm so sorry to have to meet you under these circumstances they've been separated they haven't been given any control that's the gift that a nurse can bring to that scene immediately is the ability to connect and to show them that someone actually cares about them as part of the process and their loss. The hardest part of my job as a coroner isn't the sights I see and the smells I smell. It's the grief of the survivors. Hello. Hi, my name is Bobby Jo O'Neill and I'm with the Charleston County Coroner's Office. Right. And I am so sorry I'm having to talk to you. Um, I just wanted to touch base with you uh, about the autopsy that you requested from Roper Hospital. Right. And then just wanted to get a little, a little information from you about the fall that occurred. Uh-huh. Could, could you kind of tell me how he'd been doing? He kept saying he was really tired. And I said, well, honey, you've been going too much. You need to rest. So we got home. We settled in. He said, um, I think I'm going to go ahead and get my bath. Well, he went and got in the shower and that's where he fell and he just collapsed he didn't slip or anything he just collapsed they put him in the ambulance and they took him to the hospital and the doctor came out and talked to me and said well he's doing real good he said uh, but i'm gonna have to watch him real close and we're gonna keep him on oxygen and keep him up here for right now i said okay in 10 minutes he died if we only look at death investigation as ending with the death of the individual itself and what, what caused the death and those kinds of things, we'll get part of the picture. But as nurses, I think what's important is how do we help the living piece of that relationship, if you would, continue in a way that helps them 
to grieve appropriately, to heal, to move on. We're assessing her needs and what she's needing out of this. We're gonna be, you know, the plan now is to follow up with her again. Um, as the toxicology report results come in, as their microscopic results come in, if there's something other than what, we, what they saw grossly on autopsy, we're gonna be letting them know. Um, so we're gonna be assessing again, planning again, implementing again, and it just continues to go full, full circle. It's just the nursing process over and over again. And frequently I'm asked, what is the reward as a nurse? And I'm going, when I move these living people from this place where they don't want to live themselves to helping them in a healthy fashion move back into life where they're ready to pick up the pieces and move forward, it's tremendously rewarding. And I think nurses are so equipped to do that very differently than non-nurses. I appreciate you just taking the time to treat me like a person and not just a widow. Um, I truly appreciate your compassion and it meant more than I can express in this note. Thank you for the dignity that you have given my husband and uh, throughout and how you treat us throughout the process. The more I do in this field, the more I'm convinced that there is so much we need to do in practice, but it needs to be based on evidence. And this model wouldn't be the model it is today if it wasn't evidence-based. This is just, just such an open area for people to be able, nurses in, in particular, to be able to come in and say, this is a research area that I think is interesting that can impact not only the forensic investigation, but the outcomes of that, and then health sequela afterwards. That kind of research really gives us a firm grounding for our practice and makes us credible when we either go to court or you go to the high-level policy circles and you get people to pay attention to this issue and we change laws and we change policies.